So AEW Full Gear happens Saturday night, and I think it begs a couple of key questions. Number one, if you paid the price that I did on Bleacher Report Live to get the show, do you really feel like you got your money's worth? Number two, if you're only going to do a big show like this every couple of months, which I am cool with, by the way, is this the best that you're going to give us? And question number three, does a bad start get wiped away by a better finish? Now, let me put it to you this way right now. You see a lot of biased people, both fanboy fans and fanboy media dirt sheet website cucks that are going to slobber all over this full gear show. And the reality is, is this show doesn't deserve to be slobbered on that much. It really doesn't. It got better at the end of the night. I will totally grant you that. But that in and of itself doesn't make up for what I felt was a relatively lackluster offering from this company. At least it gave me some good vibes at the end of the night. Sure. But I expect better and I demand better. That is not measuring them against anybody else. That is solely talking about what I should be able to expect from them. Like for example, you spend a few weeks building up this brandy crap with Awesome Kong just to pay it off on the buy-in show before the actual pay-per-view? No, 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 never mind. Just kind of the cringeness and ridiculous of it, where it felt like Brandy Rose was more concerned about adjusting her veil and her bodysuit than actually trying to get the gimmick of whatever the hell this is supposed to be over. This feels totally like a situation where Cody is allowing his personal to interfere with his business. And some of you might say, well, if you had her, you would do the same thing. No. When it starts to impact your business, that's not good. Because eventually that will also carry over to the personal. This is why you don't mix business and pleasure sometimes. Somebody's got to tell her that this is really, really dumb. And I know you want to be a part of this, but there are other ways for you to be a part of this that aren't this cringy crap. I'm just saying. And it wasn't even on the main card. Like, you didn't have room to fit this in on the main card? Or did you know how cringe this was and you just wanted to humor her by putting it out there so that she's your chief brand officer, even though you know it was total drizzling crap? That's a fair question, isn't it? Anyways, on to the main show. It's the Young Bucks versus Proud and Powerful Santana and Ortiz to kick off tonight. Oh, wait, 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 wait a second. Proud and Powerful. I talked about it on Twitter. This feels like a tag team name that Vince would come up with for a gay tag team where they were incredible dancers and their fashion sense was fabulous. Proud and Powerful? That's the best name that Santana and Ortiz could come up with? Give me a break. But as the match gets started, you forget about that stuff. And you try to figure out, like, who am I supposed to be behind here? Like, this is what aggravates me sometimes about the Young Bucks, and sometimes why I refer to them as the Bucks of Suck. Because it is basic things, like in-ring psychology and sensible storytelling, that they completely crap all over. And yet, the frickin' cucks, their buddies like the Meltzers of the world, will sit there and geek out and be like, Oh my god, they need their finisher after me, Meltzer Magoo, Meltzer Magoo, what you gonna do, they're friends to you too! You start off the match, and, and they're doing these things where Santana and Ortiz can't get their tags in, which is a heel tactic, but the Young Bucks are supposed to be the faces because Santana and Ortiz are the ones that attacked the Rock and Roll Express a couple weeks ago! I know I can't be taking crazy bills. Is anybody else kind of bothered by this? And then as you get into the match, whichever one of the hell of the bucks it was, Nick and Matt, I can't really remember, nor is it really consequential. You're telling this story that your knee is hurt, but then you're not telling the story because you're doing crap that features having to go off of that knee, but then you are, but then you're not, but then you are. Like, make up your mind, which one is it? It just felt like with this match, they did a hell of a lot of crap and went over 20 minutes, 20 damn minutes. That wasn't really necessary. With very little payoff. And then you stand aside as the Rock and Roll Express come out. And you got Ricky Morton, 
freaking doing Canadian destroyers and doing dives through the second rope. These guys sat there and were bumping around for 20 plus minutes. And then the Rock and Roll Express came out. <laughs> the 60 plus year old dude, however the hell old Ricky Morton is, comes out and does two big things and it steals the damn spotlight. Should you have 60 plus year old guys doing that? Who knows? Who cares? Should be a good lesson of Sometimes it's not just about the sheer volume of what you do, the quantity of what you do. It's just about the quality of what you do. So yes, this match was kind of annoying to me because it was way too long. It was just a spot fest. The storytelling was largely hodgepodge to nonsensical until it got to the end where Ricky and Robbie got their comeuppance on Santana and Ortiz. And then you get to Hangman Page versus Pac. And as I'm watching the beginning of this match, I'm saying to myself, you know, Pac should really be that mid-card heel champion. That while Jericho is your heel world champion, Pac is the number two heel in the company that works with other baby faces to get them ready and prepared to go on to face Jericho. That, that's the way I kind of look at it. I, I could make a justification that they need a mid-card strap, some type of television title or national title or international title, something along those lines. Um, I appreciate the heel and face dynamics of this match. I really did. Like It was clear. You're supposed to get behind cowboy shit, and you're supposed to hate the bastard. And the fans actually were hating the bastard and getting behind cowboy shit. That's cool. It's just this match was missing something. I don't know that this match had an incredible story going into it. And of course, because it's AEW, they failed and dropped the ball to actually set this match up. No video package, interviews, nothing like that. You can't give interview time for a match that's actually appearing on the card, but you give interview time to freaking Kip Sabian with this skater cut George Michael act. Now, where's the prioritization here? Yeah, this match was just missing something. It feels like, outside of a vacuum, that I would have enjoyed this a whole lot more than I ended up actually doing, and that was kind of sub a shame. Uh, Sean Spears, Jelly Janela. You know, I look at this match and I say, Sean Spears, with Tully Blanchard, is what professional wrestling should be. What professional wrestling used to be. And unfortunately, bad boy Jelly Janela represents what wrestling is and what wrestling has become. Like, I didn't really know that there was much story to this match. Is this just something that's being shown on their dark show? I don't watch that. A lot of other fans don't watch that. So again, it comes down to the point of you should not be forcing your fans to have to do their homework to find reasons to give a crap. You should be providing them reasons to give a crap. The best thing that happened here is Sean Spears winning. At least there is some justice in the world. But it feels like ever since you were doing this chairman stuff with him and Cody and he lost to Cody, that all of the air has really come out of the balloon here. That's really what it felt like. This match ended up being, frankly, pretty lame. And to me, so was that tag title triple threat match. Like, I felt like at this point in time in the show, you needed kind of a spot fest with a bit of an adrenaline boost for the crowd. Like, it was perfectly positioned right here in the middle of the show. You got three teams, then go out there and bump around and wake up the crowd a little bit. Wake up the viewing audience at home a little bit. And we didn't get that. We did not get that. Or at least I should say, let me correct myself, I did not get that. It was just a match. There wasn't really a story of intrigue or interest here because, again, why would we bother telling a story to set this up? You have a tag team champion in SCU that has to face off against Private Party, who, correct me if I'm wrong, didn't they beat in the semifinals? And then face off against the Lucha Brothers, who, correct me if I'm wrong again, they beat them in the finals. So they're the tag champions, but they have to go into a triple threat against two teams they just beat in a freaking tournament! And again, there really was no major story built up on TV with this leading into this match. It was the Wednesday on Dynamite, you just had a private party in a match, and if they won over the Dark Order, they got into it. That was pretty much it. You got to have reasons and purposes for these matches happening. Otherwise, well, at least for my purposes, when, when I'm watching it, I just find myself not caring and kind of tuning it out. And I know I can't be the other one. 
The match was kind of lame. It wasn't even the spot fest that I would have anticipated or frankly expected, or most importantly, that this show really needed. Because the first half of the show, folks, I'm sorry, largely stunk to high hell. And then the finish. SCU wins, and you got the fallen angel Christopher Daniels dressed up as one of the Lucha Brothers. It's like, really? This is what we need? You, you wait three weeks, and then he doesn't even interfere in the match. It's afterwards. They're like, this whole thing was just a pass to me, just like the women's championship match was. Emi Sakura versus Riho. Emi Sakura, this match is basura. You know, you get the drill. <sighs> Damn. Kenny Omega posted something on Twitter telling the story of the background of these two. And while I will give this company credit, they showed a video package before the match giving you some insight into the background and career of Riho. Kenny Omega had it all spilled out about the number of times they faced, title matches, and everything like that. Imagine if you stopped using the internet to tell these damn stories and you did it on your television show! Just saying. I'm just saying. Stop telling your stories on the damn internet and stop expecting people to have to go out there and find it! It's Bush League! And stop trying to force Rio down our throats like she's something special. It's a crock. It's an absolute crock. It's like trying to push Sasha Banks as a freaking monstrous presence. And yet Sasha Banks at least has a little bit of personality. There's a little bit of flair to her. And Rio has none of that. I'm sorry, she doesn't. What, because she's buds with Kenny Omega? That's not a good enough reason. It's a match like this with Rio and Emi Sakura where I know the hardcores and the fanboys of AEW are going to be falling over themselves to praise it, that to me exposes just how lacking this women division is in terms of star power, in terms of credible names, and in terms of focus and real commitment to treating the women equally. It is a match like this that exposes it to me. It was just bad. Do better for your women, AEW, and do better with your women. Do better by your women. That's all I'm freaking saying. So up to this point in time in the night, I'm sitting there kind of bewildered. I'm like, I spent all this money to watch this pay-per-view on Bleacher Report Live. And these last two matches better really deliver because otherwise I'm going to be really pissed that I wasted $49.99 on this damn show. And yes, I went to Bleacher Report Live. I spent the $49.99. Unlike a lot of you that are going to bitch at me in the comments about my thoughts on it where you fucking streamed it. So kiss my ass. I bought it. It means I get the right to say whatever the hell I want about it because I'm like a lot of you actually put my money where my damn mouth was. You can take all this bias crap and blow it and pound it. And that is in spite of the fact that I absolutely despise one of the EVPs of the damn company. See, I can overlook my personal feelings to be able to do what I feel is for the better good and help support other causes. You get what I'm saying? What, what a lot of you have proven totally incapable of doing. Which brings me to this AEW World Championship match. I will say, from a pure match standpoint, it took a little while for it to get going, but that was okay. You didn't need to rush this. But thankfully, they didn't go the whole 60 minutes. I appreciate the fact that both Cody and Jericho, when something of relative substance or meaning happened, they didn't just dive right into something else. It helped the commentators, even though it was Jim Ross on this night who wasn't telling any damn stories worth of crap. Um, at least it gave them a chance to try and set the table and paint the picture, and that I appreciated. Um, I enjoyed this match quite, quite a bit. And again, you had kind of a clear heel, clear baby face dynamic. Those type of matches really pop off to me because they happen so infrequently now. You really don't have clearly defined people that you can cheer for and you can hate. Now, now sure, you're going to sit there and say, yeah, because Chris Jericho was the heel and Cody was the baby face. And we know for me, of course, that that is the opposite. But nonetheless, it was a clear baby face and heel dynamic. And I enjoy that. It, it felt weird to have several stipulations or several gimmicks attached to this match. Like, why bring in Dean Malenko and Arn Anderson and Great Buddha and have them out there if you're never going to use them? And they never really did. 
felt like kind of a waste. And then the whole stipulation around Cody, if he doesn't win, he's never going to get a shot at the AEW World Championship again. Like, don't throw out stipulations that you know damn good and well you are never, ever, ever going to hold up to. Don't insult your audience like that. Just don't do that. Don't lie to them like that. And it just really wasn't needed. The story wasn't to that point. There was nothing about it that made a whole lot of sense. It just, you knew something was coming. I did really like the element of MJF throwing in the towel for Cody. I really, really like that. However, that should have been the end of it. Why is it so hard in wrestling today for companies to understand that sometimes the slow play is the better play? If you don't have to do it all, don't. If you don't have to go there yet, don't go there. Once MJF threw in the towel and he's acting all despondent, and Cody's talking to him, let that be the end of it. You didn't have to go there yet. It's like they just couldn't help themselves. Let that story play out on television. You know, actually tell the story on television over the next few weeks. You know, and if anything, swerve the fans a little bit. Have it be next time around when Cody has a pay-per-view match that MJF helps Cody win. You just didn't have to pay this all the way off like you did when you did. But of course they did, because of course wrestling today does this crap. Nobody has patience anymore. Nobody has the willingness to commit to staying with the story and taking the slow play and letting it kind of fester under the surface and simmer and kind of bubble up slowly but surely until you get the great big explosion and orgasm in your short path. That said, once you did it, you did it, and you can't walk it back. And we could all see this was coming, which I think, again, was part of the reason why I did not want them to go all the way here. Because if you were trying to present yourself as different in the wrestling marketplace, the one thing you should not do is package your product, by and large, like the competitor. And in particular, what you shouldn't do is make your thing so goddamn predictable that everybody can freaking see it coming. However, once MJF leaves the ramp, Really nice touch by AEW. I'm going to give them credit for this. Really, really nice touch of having the person in the AEW shirt planted. I'm sure it's some type of indie wrestler. Somebody who works backstage from them. Going and throwing the beer on MJF. Like, that's a moment. That's something memorable. That's something you can latch onto. That is something that people can relate to and people understand. Like, that's something you can run with. That was really well played by AEW to have that plant there to do that. It's the little things that matter sometimes so very much. And while you rushed this, you at least salvaged it a little bit by doing what you did with the plant. And if you don't think that was a plant, people, then I don't know what the hell to tell you. It's too perfectly planned for it not to be. Let's not be dumb about it. It was a freaking plant, and you goddamn good at one. Know it. So right guy wins in Jericho. They did the turn, and I didn't want them to do all the turn, but I can live with that. And then we get to the unsanctioned lights out match between John Moxley and Dean Ambrose. Between John Moxley and Dean Ambrose, really? Between John Moxley and Kenny Omega, what in the hell was that? Anyways, still better than what JR did on commentary on Saturday night. Am I right? Am I right? You know, when I think of an unsanctioned match, you know, I think of don't have your refs in an AEW shirt. Don't have commentary. Don't have stuff come up on the Tron. Don't have entrance music. Have none of that. It's unsanctioned means that the company wants nothing to do with it. Not just a hold harmless type of thing. This is more what this match, this was more of a hold harmless match than it was truly to me an unsanctioned lights out match. But as far as the match itself goes, it was sick, it was sadistic, it was twisted. It was perfectly positioned in the right place because there was no way in the hell anything was going to follow this match. Furthermore, with it involving the two guys like Moxley and Omega, I look at this and I say, it's the right call to have the unsanctioned match go on last. 
because it kind of was weird to have an unsanctioned match go on and then come back to the regular show. Like, for a lot of reasons, I actually really appreciated that they put this on last. Now, the one question I had going into it, and still the one question especially I have coming out of this match, was did the story really necessitate it? I'm not so concerned about the violence. I grew up watching ECW in the 90s. So the violence in and of itself does not bother me. The violence, if done correctly with the right story, featuring the right competitors, angry with each other for the right reasons, that makes sense. I just don't know if the story between these two, and yeah, maybe you could say it's lasted several months, and maybe it's because I'm coming in relatively new to the product that maybe there were other things in Japan and other places that make this make more sense. And then that could be true. So if you pay more attention and you're more hardcore in your wrestling watching, maybe this totally made sense to you. And maybe that's part of the problem for me, but maybe, again, that's part of the problem for the company is you don't do a good enough job of telling enough of the story to where you make this feel like the match is necessitated. Because I don't know if it was. I don't know if it wasn't. Uh, you know, I just... I enjoyed it for what it was, if that makes sense. Now, if you're going to go there, then go there. Don't have an unsanctioned lights-out match and just have it be another street fight. That I appreciate about what these two guys did. That I enjoy. If you're going to do it, if you want to get nuts, let's get nuts. Don't sit there and just have a basic street fight where you use a steel chair once or twice, a steel steps, and a kendo stick, or one or two big spots, and then you go, uh, Bob's your uncle, it's all over. I mean, these guys got after it. They really, really got after it. And, and that, at least, lived up to the stipulation. Was this truly the match of the night for me? Uh, I'm not sure if it was or if Cody versus Jericho was. I'm not sure. But I'm not going to come on here and rage about the violence because it would feel incredibly hypocritical to rage about the violence in and of itself in, a, in kind of a bubble when griping about other places, doing peachy, kitty-friendly crap. Um, you know, wrestling is supposed to be presented as an extreme sport. It's about violence. The whole nature of everything that is done is presented around the notion of violence. And sometimes there is more violence, higher levels of violence, than there are other times. I certainly wouldn't have paid the price that I paid for this pay-per-view expecting this to be a standard wrestling match. Nor would I have paid that full pay-per-view price just expecting some lame-ass type of street fight that I could have gotten from so many other companies throughout the years. I paid money in part to see this unsanctioned lights-out match be a big-time brawl. And I got that. So I feel satisfied with that. That said, while these last two matches delivered each in their own way, and while these last two matches in large part, saved this show for me and saved me from coming on here and totally raging against it. The show, by and large, was still not very good. It still was a relative disappointment, although not that surprising to me, because, again, it comes down to, especially with most of the first half of the show, up until you got to these last two matches. If you don't tell stories to get people to have reasons to care, then they're not going to care, and the matches don't matter. They don't matter. It's amazing when you have people where you have some type of semblance of the story, and there's some type of reason to care, and there is something that matters. You know, like even the thing with Moxley and Omega. You know, they're sitting there busting out the glass from the broken table, and then lots of sick, sadistic stuff. But in some ways, at least you could say they were tying in things. Like, those are storytelling elements that I live for, that I really appreciate. This company can do better. This company should do better. And we damn need to expect them to do better. Stop coming on here and pumping them full of smoke to kingdom freaking come and call them off for some of the crap. It's not that hard, and it doesn't make you less of a fan. If anything, it might show that you love them more because you want them to do better. Stop apologizing for all their lame-ass stuff they did the first half of the night because a lot of it sucked. Thankfully, Cody Rhodes, Chris Jericho, Moxley Omega saved the night enough for me 
to where I didn't have to totally come on here and rage against this show. And that's why you need me. Because you have far too many people that are either friends with people in AEW, so their bias is there. They're getting some type of kickback or something from AEW, so their bias is there. Or you got people that are so anti one company and so pro the other company that they're afraid to ever have any type of standards or reasonable discussion about anything whatsoever. Or they're trying to get a damn job in the business or in particular with that company. That's why you need me. I know I'm an angry wrestling man sometimes, but OTR Essential is not the wrestling show you want. It's just the wrestling show you need because of shows like this and nights like this. You need me to provide you that balance that you're just not going to get from a whole lot of other people. And you know what's true.